and thanks for tuning in to the Path 11 Podcast. I am your host, April Hanna. At the Path 11 Podcast, we are here trying to deliver leading-edge research on consciousness, healing, and metaphysics. And just like you, we are trying to answer the big questions about life. Who are we? Why are we here? And what is our purpose? We hope by listening to our podcast, it will make each day you live on Earth a little easier to understand. And now for today's podcast. All right, everyone. I am super excited about today's guest. I would like to introduce you to Lee Harris, and he is the author of Energy Speaks. He is also an intuitive medium, transformational leader, musician, and visual artist. In 2004, he began holding channeling sessions and readings in his home, and today he leads workshops throughout the world. A native of England, and I absolutely love and adore his accent already, um, he is now based in California. Lee, welcome to the Path 11 podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Yes. And, you know, I I do have to say I read um, so many books that come across my desk, you know, with all the guests that we have. We're almost up to maybe about 200 shows so far. And there are some books that come across that I just know that I need to keep, that I need to have, that I need to touch, that I need to hold, and I'm not giving them away. (laughs) And this is one of those books. And I would say in over maybe the 200 guests that we've had on, maybe I've kept five to seven of those. Um, but this one, I, I can't wait for it to be released. I know it's it's not out yet, but it's going to be out possibly March 2019 here, maybe April. Um, Energy Speaks, it is phenomenal. And um, one of the things that I really, I'm going to just really talk a lot about it because I loved it so much. But one of the things that I find is that this is a book that is timeless. And I know that this is um, kind of a reference tool of life and something that I know I will always be able to go back to no matter what age I am, no matter what issue I'm having. It really just feels like one of these handbooks for Earth and how to get through some of this stuff. And it's absolutely beautiful. So I feel really, really honored and excited to have you on the show to talk about this today. Wow, thank you so much. That that means the world. Thank you. And um, yeah, and the, I think the, the the official release date is March 26th. So um, probably by the time this show goes out, um, hopefully the books will be, uh, they will be available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, all the usual kind of places. Great. So maybe we can um, start off like we usually do for our listeners to give them a little bit of your background, because I know I loved the way that you describe this is um, one day you ended up having a blind date with a group called the Z's. So I'd like you to kind of let the audience know how that blind date came to be and maybe, you know, what you were doing, how this took you by surprise and how this channeling started in your life. Yeah, so um, I was 23 years old, and it was I was in London where I was working at the time, and I was on what we call the tube train, the London Underground, going to work. It was very early in the morning, and I was really in my normal routine, which at that time would have been, uh, you know, I wanted to be a singer songwriter. I was focused on trying to make that happen. Um, I had left one career, which was theater. I had just kind of given up on everything that I was doing with theater because it just wasn't resonating anymore. So I was also still very much recovering from being a a very overweight child. I had bulimia, I had eating disorders all through my teens. Um, So I still had a lot of, um, at that time, quite hard self-judgment and self-doubt. I think that self-judgment and self-doubt are just part of the human experience. And I think as we get as we get good at working with those, they become minimal or things that we notice and we, we know not to buy into. But at that time, that wasn't my reality. Um, it was it was a tough it was I was just coming out of a really tough period in my life. And so all of these conversations I was having in my own head that you do, you know, you're thinking, okay, well, I need to do this and that's not really going to work or "Mm, how am I going to, a lot of dissatisfaction thoughts in my brain that morning. All of a sudden from the left came this voice (laughs) that literally said, well, that's an interesting way to look about, look at that, but you're wrong. And Mm -hmm. I was like, huh? Just, you know, just really, because this had never happened before. Um, 
and literally I started to have a back and forth conversation in my own head, but it was it was one very distinct voice that was coming from the left of my head. And if I describe it in physical terms, it felt like it was positioned about 12 inches above my head off to the left. Um, and then there were all my own thoughts, which, you know, I was used to, I, I know what it's like when you're having mental thoughts. This was very different. And I started to have this answer and response conversation with the voice. And, you know, at first you're like, oh my God, am I Am I, is this schizophrenia? <laughs> is this is right. this the beginning of when they take you to the the, the institution? Um, but but I I've, I've I immediately started asking questions, going I don't what are you? Who are you? And they were like, we are your guides, and you just haven't heard us for a long time, but now you can. So literally, I scurried off to work that day, tried not to think about it, then went home that night could still talk to the voice as if it was a person right next to me. And it all changed really that night when I started to write down questions and answers. And I would literally transcribe what I was hearing from the voice. And when I actually had it down on paper and I could refer back to it the next day and I could see how helpful those answers were, whether it was a question about my personal life or whether it was just a question about the world at large, then the transformation really started. And I started to understand that that what I had accessed was far cleverer than I was and uh, really useful and loving, but firm. So if ever I was wrong about something or if ever, you know, it was my own ego's idea about something, they would tell me pretty quickly um, and explain why. And, and that was that was how it began. Yeah. And one of the interesting things um, that I picked up on was when you were kind of asking them, well, you know, who are you and what is your name? And you had said that they said, uh, we know that names are very important for you down mm -hmm. there, you know, to be able to identify because we do identify so much with people's names, right? To be able to call it something. Um, so I just found that interesting with other channels that I have spoken to, to, um, you know, one of the most uh, well-known is probably Abraham. Abraham Hicks, you know, um, Esther Hicks, that channels Abraham, but you know, she calls it this group of Abraham. And some mm. people that I begin to introduce some of that work to, they're like, well, who's Abraham? And I'm like, yeah, good question, you know. But um, also with disease, it also seems or appears to me that it's a collective group of consciousness. And maybe it's not even a collective, but it is still one. Um, but I know that they've come through to you with different names that start with the letter Z. Yes, um, it, it is. It is a really interesting thing because one of the things that I realized I was I was uh, very different to, to to most people around channeling was I didn't really care where they came from or who they were. I really cared about the quality of the information and the direct effect that it was having on my life. So funnily enough, it was other people <laughs> that kind of got me to ask more questions about their origins and, um, you know, how many of them had been incarnate on earth and how many of them hadn't. And the way they described themselves is, you know, exactly as you said, they said, you can think of us as a consciousness library. And they said, we are a group of 88 entities who then extend wider into source. And Zachary said, you can think of me as the spokesperson. I'm, I'm the kind of lead voice. After several years, I actually had contact with two other um, energies in the group who said we would be, you would see us as more feminine in energy. Therefore, their names were Zayadora and Zafariah. And for a while, I channeled all three of them differently. And there would always be a slightly different feeling Zayadora would really speak about heart energy and about the, the oneness in our heart. Zachary would be a little more universal affairs and the way that humans work. And Zafariah would speak more about mystical energy and how our third eye and how our intuition work. And then at a certain point, they, they said, we're just going to homogenize again because it no longer serves to separate out. It was useful for a while, um, but but really what it comes down to for me is everything can connect to everything else. So when they explain that they're a group of 88 that extend wider into source, that makes sense to me in much the same way that you and I are having a conversation now, but each of us are connected to so many people. So 
you know, here we are, Lee and April, but we're also made up of all of these people that we have been influenced by in our life, our parents, our friends, our lovers, uh, the people that we meet in the street. So that that really helped me understand it. But but some people really need to know where did they come from and what are they. And the problem is when you're dealing with spirit, spirit is no longer uh, trapped in the human body, if you like, is no longer solely limited to being in a human body. So it's it's interesting when you ask those questions, you find out how many different incarnations and what kinds of positions and places that people have played out, but it starts to dissolve. Uh, certainly your, your interest in that kind of stuff starts to dissolve the more you ask them the bigger questions in my experience. Right. Yeah, I would I would agree with that as well, because you're really, um, you know, trying to get to some of the bigger picture questions and all those that may be helpful, helpful to focus a person's attention or intent or maybe even some of their fear. Right. Um, Definitely. To maybe humanize it a little bit more or something like if I could call you by name or somehow envision you in some way that just feels safe, that it helps you know, in that way as well. April, I love that you bring that up because I think that was something that I was always sensing with a lot of the questions that I would, I would have people going, well, who are they and where are they from? To me, what I now understand is so much of our culture has scared us away from our own intuitive power, our own connection to source. Um, if you look at very heavy religious programming, um, not the kinds of religions where people are, are free to really lean into their faith, but more some of the religions or particular denominations or, or priests or pastors who are much more controlling than that. Um, those are the, those are often the, the imprints that, that we carry around, oh, I, how do I know this is a good source? And, you know, what I always say is, well, <laughs> work with it, you know, assess it, you know, take a few weeks and ask some questions and see what happens and pay attention to what's going on. I think that can be the danger where sometimes people give their power away to spirit too, because certainly religion in, in many cases has encouraged people to give their power away to the priest or to God and to see themselves as not of that same energy. And I think I think that's why some of that fear comes up and some of people's trepidation around connecting with their own connection to divinity or spirit or a higher power. Yeah, and that's also why I love how you started the book out um, in chapter one about owning your own personal power. I mean, every chapter when I really say this is a handbook, it really, it really is, you know, for life, it's like, and just the flow of it, owning your own personal power, then you move into the self love journey, um, the art of receiving abundance, money, sleep, you know, our awareness, sexual energy, which by the way, thank you so much for putting that in chapter eight, because I feel like, and I, I, can't wait to get to this. You're the first person that's actually talking about sex, our sexual energy, um, the masculine, the feminine, and combining it with spirituality. And I don't think we talk about that enough. Um, you know, and then again, just the flow of the whole book too, of talking about successful relationships, and then it dives into family peace. And I know that you were talking about one of the Z's, um, uh, having more of that feminine energy and talking about the power of women. I mean, it just kind of goes on and on. It, it just flowed so beautifully. Um, but yeah, that, you know, going back to chapter one, two, it's really owning that personal power of who we are and what we are um, and connecting with our souls. Thank you. Well, I, I work with a wonderful editor, Deborah Evans, who's a friend. And Deborah has, has had a lot of experience in, in this field, the self-growth field, but she's also really well attuned to channeling. It's a, it's a tough thing um, taking verbal channels and transposing them into the written form. Um, so this book has gone through many, many revisions um, around the editing. But one of the things that really struck me and you mentioned the timelessness we had so much material to go through we were trying to come up with a map of what are the the kind of key points that that we that we could include here because some of this material was was first channeled to groups say 12 years ago and what has blown my mind really through the editing process and through getting the feedback from people who've read the book is a couple of different things number one 
perhaps these things were a bit more ahead of their time back then, because I know at the time of channeling them and to the groups I was channeling them to around the world, it definitely felt um, perhaps a little more radical. What I'm loving in 2019 is I'm seeing the energy of these channels begin to permeate society more. Um, and that's fantastic. It's like, oh, great, this kind of stuff is is becoming more the norm. And the sex chapter had to be included because um, sexual energy, what I loved about it was it was very um, inclusive. And as the chapter says, sexual energy is not the act of sex. Sexual energy drives so much of our life in in a really almost invisible way, but it's life force energy, it's creative energy, it's relational energy. And sure, you can run that energy at high dosages through the act of sex, but it's actually the life force that's, that's moving through the planet all the time. And um, that one was a no brainer because we we have a lot of these on MP3 recordings um, that were the original recordings of the original times they were channeled. And that recording is always in the kind of most popular three recordings of the whole year. And that recording is 11 years old. So um, a friend of mine said, why don't channelers talk about sex and sexual energy more? And I was like, they don't. And they were like, no, I follow yeah. lots of them and they don't really talk about it. And I, I was really kind of surprised because I feel like the Z's have been talking about it for, a, you know, a decade or so. So, um, so yeah, that one was a no brainer. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know a lot about, you know, the Kundalini energy, but if I also think of like using different words of like the root chakra or the sacral chakra, I mean, maybe it's also just about really using the word that we use in modern day language, which is sexual energy, which can peak and say, oh, yes, that's what, you know, some of that is about. Because Kundalini energy, from what I understand, too, is just another word for exactly what you said. It's that life force energy. You know, when we think about the root chakra in our body um, and that it's that that's our life force as well you know the energy enters up through there in that in that teachings but i think probably what helps is just to say uh the word that we use to identify it in the language here on earth a little bit more you know so so true and and interestingly i did um a channel a few months ago and an audio recording um called kundalini uh life force energy and the z's really do talk about that and they they talked about in in the audio channel um they said when you see children and they're running around as a group and they are full of life they said that is an example of kundalini energy obviously it shows up differently in adults and especially if kundalini energy happens to you in a very extreme way, which to some people it does, you know, it comes along and awakens them, awakens their senses. But they say, if you put a group of young children together and they're all running around, expressing, full of life force, full of energy, getting electrically charged with each other, they say that's Kundalini in action. And that, that, that to me was a, a helpful way of seeing it. But the language piece is so important because words can be an entry point or a barrier. You know, if, if you if you use language that someone has a negative association with or a different idea about, it can shut down someone's entry point to the truth that that language is trying to convey. So you're absolutely right. Language is so key. Yeah. And so often, many times when people are trying to explain the language of spirit or explain a very spiritual experience like a near death you know one of the first things that people usually say is there's no words for this <laughs> you mm -hmm. know it's it's so hard to find the words it's so hard to put into words so i do find that to be you know a challenge in in the translation of really being able to interpret you know what we're feeling sensing hearing experiencing in the non-physical and bringing it into the physical. And like you said, it, it probably is a challenge, um, you know, to take the verbal channeling sessions and then put it into a book like you guys did, but it's, it's phenomenal. He's a great job. We had very good invisible editors. And whenever I would want to change a, a certain sentence or a certain word, I would literally hit no. Like I would literally, you know, the Z's were on my shoulder. So a lot of the time, some of the adjustments I was making so that it read well on the page, it's very different when you have tone and sound and vibration. Um, but but yeah, most of the time, any of the small edits I was making, um, they were in agreement with. And for me, that was just really wanting to be a bridge between the channel and the audience. Um, but occasionally they would be, uh, they would be, no, <laughs> I'd be like, okay, doesn't fully make sense to me 
but okay. Um, but but it's funny. I love what you just said about it's it's hard to translate this stuff because the Z's will often say we do our best with language and we do our best using Lee's facility with language but we can only scrape the surface of what we mean and so they often say that uh, channeled information is a wonderful bridge to the spirit world but it scrapes the surface of both the size of it uh, and the amount of energy information available to us however it is a bridge and if we have a bridge that can be the thing that leads us into our own greater experience which is why i think channeling for those who channeling works for or who resonate with it or those for whom channeling has been their awakening or one of their biggest keys to awakening um, it, it's an incredible bridge because it can lead you into your own intuition and your own experiences yes i totally agree and uh, my next question for you i asked this of of quite a few people and part of it is just me also trying to wrap it around for myself, for my clients, the world, you know, the people that I come in contact with. Um, and it ties into chapter two about the self-love journey. And also the exercises that are given in this book are phenomenal and wonderful. And as a meditation teacher, you and this book and the Z's provided me a lot of material to bring to my classes uh, for some of these guided <laughs> meditations. So thank you. Oh, um, but I love the three week kind of self self love journey. And this this question always boggles my mind because I see so many people I have gone through it myself. I still have moments where, like you said, um, in the beginning of our talk, judgment and self-doubt, right, is a part of the human experience. Mm. And so many of us, and like yourself, go through these periods of not loving ourselves, knowing that we're not loving ourselves, wanting so desperately to love ourselves. And I know intellectually that we are these beautiful spirits. And I have sat across from so many people um, who are so beautiful and I see their true essence and their energy and they just can't find that self love. And I, I always ask people, why do we forget it? <laughs> what happens when we come from spirit and there is this true knowing that we're always trying to return back to, we know at the base of everything we are love, yet we forget it. And then we're here to be reminded or return back to it. And, and it is one of the things that I see over and over again, it kind of goes through in your book too. You know, if you're not feeling worthy of money or abundance or love, uh, the ability to receive, right? That's a whole mm. other chapter. We can give the love, but can we receive it? Mm -hmm. And why are we so much better at giving it to others and not ourselves? So I would love um, just some more guidance and understanding about this self-love journey and why so many of us are not in love with ourselves yet. Yeah, I love that you've zeroed in on that because it's so true what you've just said. Um, so, I mean, a couple couple of different things. So, as you said, we came from spirit and that is a, a, a very, shall we say, easy place to feel pure in. So, for example, we meditate, we do yoga. Um, maybe we don't do any of that kind of stuff, but we just have a fantastic laugh with our friend and we walk away from our friend feeling lit up by the connection that the two of us just had, which can be equal to yoga or meditation. You know, it just depends on who you are, how you're wired. But really for me, it's disconnection that the judgment and the self-doubt exist in. And the truth is, if you think about it, Yes, we're from spirit, but we're also in the human body. And I think this is the really tricky part for spiritual seekers, light workers, sensitives, intuitives. I know that to be true because it was tricky for me when I was, you know, first really opening up to spirit and metaphysics from my late teens, going to workshops. I would get what I would call the workshop high, where I would, you know, come away from the workshop feeling all lit up and like free of, oh my God, I've just freed so much fear and yeah, yeah, yeah. And then a week later, I would come back down. And at the time I would perceive that I had regressed. But actually what was happening was I'd actually expanded and I had, ex I had moved some parts of myself so that the next anchor point then would rise to the surface. So let's say I'd suddenly decided I'm going to go for that career I've been afraid of and that I've said I'm not going to go for. Yes, it feels euphoric in the moment, but then you move into the gray area that is the 
discomfort zone that most people protect themselves from walking into. So a lot of people, you know, talk about awake people and conscious people and unconscious people. And really, to me, unconsciousness is when the judgments and the self-doubts are invisible scripts in your mind that you aren't even aware are there. Uh, it, it's kind of running the show insidiously, and it comes from human society. It comes from your mother shouting at you when you presented her with a beautiful painting that you'd made her age six. And because you disturbed her at the wrong moment, she shouts at you and goes, oh, I, d I don't want that right now. It's not even the right color. And you internalize that and you get clamped down on your art gift. You're like, oh, my God, my mother just shouted at me when I wanted to give her this gift. So I will now judge that I can't paint. I will now tell myself I can't paint. I use the wrong colors because I never want to walk into that kind of energy with my mother again. I never want someone to shout at me like that because it felt so horrible. Now, these kinds of things happen all the time from birth. Um, and when we interact with other kids and we get bullied or judged. So the thing I always try and remind people that it took me years to figure out is whatever self-judgment you are carrying, you did not make it up. You did not create it. It existed in the world. It existed in another human. It existed in a group. You interacted with it. They aimed it at you. And so you then internalized it so that you would never have it aimed at you again. In much the same way, I always say, if you get out of an abusive friendship or relationship and you wonder why a few weeks after that you're having a hard time in your own mind, it's because the judgment and punishment that you were, shall we say, hiring someone else to play out for you in your life, it existed in you too, and it has become hardwired in you. So now you've removed that person, you're going to have an echo chamber of judgment, self-attack, self-doubt, but now it's the self. So the thing to do when you encounter your own self-judgment and self-doubt when you're on the path, shall we say, or when you've done some work on yourself is to ask yourself a couple of questions. Number one, is this coming from me or is it coming from the friend I just left at coffee 10 minutes ago? It's not that she was judging you, but perhaps she was in a really judgmental place. Perhaps you were helping her through this really difficult thing she's going through and you walk away from her and you don't necessarily backtrack and go, oh, well, 10 minutes ago, I was with Julie, who's really caught in a very judgmental energy right now towards you know, herself or her life. And I was helping her with that. And so now a little piece of that is affecting me and it's running through my own brain. Or are you stretching yourself and pushing yourself beyond your comfort zone? So your judgment comes up to try and protect you. And an example I can give for that is, you know, I, I had someone ask me a few years ago, they went, wow, do you just have no self judgment now? And I went, no, not at all. I said, I still experience those human things, but I experience them at greater levels they no longer hold me back from being able to access things like gratitude, joy, love, changing my focus. But if I'm stretching myself, if I'm going into a new area of the arena in perhaps my work or my life or my marriage or anything, that stuff can come up because what I'm meeting is an old limit that used to keep me in place. And it's just waving at me going, oh, you sure you want to go over here? I'm not sure you do. Are you sure you're capable of this? And it's trying to protect me from some level of impact. So that was a very long answer. And I, I feel like I only skimmed the surface. But, but it's such a complicated thing. But I would say the thing to remember is that judgment exists everywhere and in so many people. And one of the things that doing private sessions for, I did private sessions until last year, so almost 15 years, about four or 5,000 people by the time I'd finished. Um, I saw how we, everybody is struggling or suffering with some part of the human condition, even the most successful or seemingly happy people. There's something that they're pushing against and it's, you know, what you might call the society virus, the society judgment template, the energy that exists in everybody that shows up in us. And I always think if we were more comfortable and less ashamed of sharing what we're going through on a daily basis with people, 
it would lose some of its power. It would it would lose some of the hold that it has over us because we'd all be able to help each other with it. So, yeah, that's a very long answer, but I, I hope that made sense. It did. And it's a beautiful answer. And there's so much in that that I could listen back to about 25 times and pull more and more from it. And But one of the things that you said towards the end, which uh, this book really made me do, is to really start... Uh, focusing in on these old limit and old limits and old beliefs. And the, the chapters that I did that the most on, um, is abundance and money for me. Cause mm. right now I'm, um, it was funny in the book. It says, well, if you're living in a one bedroom apartment and then all of a sudden I like looked behind my shoulder, I'm like, <laughs> are they here? What's going on? <laughs> you know, <laughs> did you have abundance in the past? Well, yes, I was married and owned the house. What's happening here? <laughs> I was a little freaked uh, out, but, but it was interesting because there were so many questions in there. And right now, um, you know, I've shared this on a couple of recent uh, podcasts. So, you know, my audience is going to know that I'm, I'm trying to buy a house, you know, so all this fear of bills and closing costs. And do I have enough? And right now it looks like that I don't, but, um, I'm so ready for it. I feel it. I've answered so many of the questions in these two chapters that you put out there, like how much money are you really ready for and how much it's not about the money, but abundance equals surrender. And that was a totally different way for me, um, to look at the word, to look at what is happening with money. But as I started picking apart through these exercises in what the book was teaching me, I'm like, there has, there is has got to be that old limit or old belief because there's so much of what you ask us in the book. And I'm like, yes, Hey, I am ready. I deserve it. I do feel worthy. I could say yes to so many things. And then, but there's yet, it has not, something has not yet clicked or shifted in the space that I know is available to me with this surrendering trust abundance. And, you know, like you said in the book, you know, money is just, it's not really anything, Mm -hmm. you know, it's nothing really. It's, it's a form of energy, but, but it's not as much as we give the power of it to be. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but yeah, so, so I just want to touch on the limits. Oh, no, I love, I love everything you just said. And, And something comes to me, which I think a really good affirmation for you in this situation would be, I support myself to let this be easy. Ah, thank because you. Let me let me explain why I said that, because there's many ways you could take that sentence. But what I mean is acknowledge the stress and the stretch of this for you, because it's really important we do that. And this this kind of goes beautifully back to the whole self-judgment thing. One of the things the Z's said to me many years ago, and in fact, it, them, it, no, it was to me, and then they said it to a group, is when you catch a part of you that's struggling, suffering, judging yourself, they said, celebrate that. Mm-hmm. Actually recognize you have the awareness to notice something that you are struggling with. And they said, celebrate it. Now, of course, most of us don't. Most of us are like, oh, no, (laughs) I'm not abundant enough. You know, that's the human mind and that's the human programming or it's the voice of our father or whoever it was that, you know, had the, the money area. But one of the things I always say is if you had a friend in hospital recovering from an operation, you know, you go and see the friend and you take them some flowers and you write them a card and you go, oh, I'm thinking of you and I'm sending you love every day. If you know that you're going through one hell of a battle around abundance behind the scenes, and sure, you're showing up at work and nobody really knows, but you're actually really going through emotional, energetic, psychological stress to try and move a pattern, what we don't tend to have is another aspect in ourselves that I think we all need to develop that is sympathetic toward you. You know, a kind of loving parent that would say, oh, she's going through a lot of school right now because she's trying to buy a house. So I'm going to, you know, put her on the sofa, put a blanket, suggest that she watches a movie to switch off for two hours just to kind of rest because I can see she's pushing herself to her limit. So I think we have to develop that loving parent in ourselves and recognize, wow, this is kind of stressful for me. I'm trying to change a pattern, but it's not easy. It's, It's hurting a bit. So you have to be kind to yourself, too. And I think that can be the rocket fuel to change. When you go, I support myself to allow this to be easy, you open up to two possibilities. If it's not going to be easy, if it's going to put more stress on you to get the house that you're currently going for, then long term, 
this might have been a wonderful aim. This might have been a wonderful rehearsal for the house that is going to go through. But it might be too much of a stress for you at this time that you're also willing to let it go if it's going to ultimately stress you out in a, in a way that would be unhelpful to your life. Or the other side happens because you're willing to support and love yourself through what's a stressful process. The universe responds by sending you more support than you thought. And you're like, oh, my God, where did this money come from? I didn't see this. Oh, wh what do you mean there's a check coming in? What do you mean this relative is giving me something? You know, so I support myself to allow this to be easy is actually acknowledging that it's hard and acknowledging that some part of your energetic body is, is going through a stress to change this. And I think that's the kind of invisible thing. We, we get a lot of gung-ho, I'm going to change this. Yay, I just left the workshop and I walked on the hot coals and everyone cheered me. But what happens when you go home <laughs> and you're by yourself and the voice of negativity or doubt creeps in or starts to influence you? That's the moment to kind of, you know, be the be the visitor to yourself at the hospital and go, just wanted to pop in and send you some love. I'm going to I'm going to give you two hours to not think about the house. This is stressing us out. We're just going to go to the park for a walk and listen to some nice music and not think about it for three hours. You know what I mean? I do. I do. And that affirmation is beautiful. That's a gift for me. Thank you. And yeah. um, I had a moment in there again, these questions that you proposed were so good because in, I don't know if it was in the abundance or the money one, I, you know, I had to ask myself this question where uh, you do talk about where some people will find, uh, I forget the wording, but they'll find something within the struggle that is kind of reinforcing something. Um, and I don't know if I'm putting it in the right words, but it's kind of what you were just talking about when I asked myself, well, okay, so yeah, this does, this doesn't feel so easy right now. Mm -hmm. It feels a struggle, but what's my secondary gain of that? Do I have a secondary gain of that? And I do, mm -hmm. you know, I had that aha moment where I said, gosh, that's been the story of most of my life. And I've kind of been, um, prided on that. Like people say, oh, she works so hard, you know, and gosh, she's just able to do it. And there's something about this overcoming when you don't have enough, so it was a huge uh, awakening for me to answer that question and say, ah, so maybe I'm hanging on to that struggle. My ego has a little bit of attachment there, right? Because I've been rewarded for that, um, you know, to be so strong, right? April, so strong. You're just so strong. You can get through anything. But um, yeah, but what hearing you say that affirmation, that is exactly what I want to feel. I support myself to allow this to be easy. And in reading that chapter, I was like, yeah, I no longer need um, to have this gain of the struggle. Like, and, and it just dawned on me. I'm like, I didn't even know I was doing that. So, but thank uh, you. <laughs> yeah. That, I, I think, I, you know, number one, this is your podcast. So of course your audience, your listeners are, are going to resonate with you. That's why they would be here. But one of the things that you raise for me, and, and I, I identify with this myself, and I, I know a lot of the people who like my work would identify with, with your personality type, April, is because you are somebody who connects with others, is very empathic, is sensitive to others, you're here on the planet to be a bridge for other people. That's your role. You know, you are the reason you're in broadcasting is because you have the ability to connect with people. Now, this is where things get tricky for people like you or me or lots of the listeners is you also have to be willing to allow all of your relationships to change if you or your circumstances change. So let's say suddenly you came into, uh, let's, let's go with an extreme example. Let's say tomorrow someone says, hey, April, I've been listening to your podcast and I love what you and Mike are doing and I love the, the filmmaking you're doing. Um, I'm a billionaire and I'm going to give you guys $2 million. So I'm going to give you half a million dollars each for your life and I'm going to give you a million dollars for your mission. Um, and that's how I'm going to organize it. So there you go. Now, on the one hand, you and Mike might be like, wow, this is great. We can buy the house. We've got a million dollar budget for the movie we wanted to make, you know, whatever it is that you guys are working on next. But that would change you. And I'm not saying it would fundamentally change all your good qualities. It would change your experience of life. You'd be you just overnight, just things would change in such a way that it would also affect 
the relationships in your life. Now, I'm not saying that would necessarily be negative, but I, you know, I, I have friends, I have s- several friends who are in positions of real wealth and we, I and they have talked about the kind of distortions that go on for people around money and around abundance because they link it to power. And so they've talked about some of the horror stories of people's expectations of them because they have wealth. And they said, you know, we don't mind giving the money, but we've had some really nasty experiences with people where we've given money and then they've turned on us because they can't quite handle it. Now, that's just one example. But the reason I bring this up with you is I think when you are trying to create a new reality for yourself and you're built the way you are, you also have to be willing to say, and I trust that I can let go of my responsibility to everybody else in my life while I do this. Because wherever I land, I know that I will come from a benevolent place to those relationships. But if I land in a different place to the position they needed or wanted me to be in, we're all gonna have to learn to be okay with it and adjust. Mm. And if we can't, I can't stop myself getting there because they would be more comfortable if I wasn't fill in the blank as successful in a happy relationship when they're not in one, you know, depending on people's dependencies. So with you, I would say that would be very subtle. I wouldn't say you have any like big codependent things going on in your life, but those subtleties are really important. Um, it's, it's knowing when to put on the hat of now I'm focusing on my individual soul and my individual path. And ultimately I will serve the greater good or now I'm focusing on the greater good. I'm using my body, my energy, my role on this earth to focus on the greater good. And I think, I think we have to learn to go between those two. I was very deficient in focusing on the needs and growth of the self compared to the needs and growth of everyone around me, because, you know, who doesn't love giving gifts? I mean, it's the best thing, right? Okay. So I had to, I had to learn the, the self receiving piece at a new level, at a soul level. I don't just mean someone giving me a gift. I mean, at a soul level, I was like, okay, what do I need to grow through next? And do I trust that if I give myself that growth, that those I'm serving will either come with me or they won't come with me and that's okay too. So I, I don't know if that resonates, but that just came through really strongly when I was listening to you. And I'm sure that connects with several listeners too. Yeah. Who? Yeah, it resonates. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that came through strong to you. And, uh, oh, well, I've was, been there. I've been yeah. there. So, you know, it's the same lesson I've had to wow. learn and go through and refine, you know, and, and I think our lessons refine too. You know, if abundance is a struggle in your early life, I mean, I remember six years ago, when I had, you know, I mean, I've, I've done this work for, for 15 years, but six years ago, I'd taken on my first two employees part time. And I remember like, you know, <gasps> is there going to be enough in the bank account for the tax bill? You know, kind of, <laughs> that was where I was at in 2013 and 2012. And, you know, trying to figure that stuff out. And now it's at a, it's at a, it's a completely other level. I mean, I have 10 or 11 people on the payroll every month and I'm managing you know a business as well as creating my work and I've I've had to learn a lot but there are different things that I I now have to learn it, it's no longer worried about the tax bill but I have refined growth experiences around the management of money or the learning around that stuff so yeah I I think it's it's good to just embrace any of the stuff that we're going through because it will grow with us and it will change and morph. Yeah. And I am sure that we have a lot of listeners, um, too, that can apply that to their life as well. And it's actually, you know, of course, I'm, I'm not surprised that you hit on that and it came that that came out so strongly <laughs> because I'm, I'm going through that in my, you know, business right now. I've done, uh, individual, you know, clinical counseling for almost 18 years now, 15, seven, anywhere between 15 and 18. I can't do the math that quickly. Um, but I've been getting a call more in the past two years that it's time to move away. And I guess kind of like how you did with these individual sessions and my soul is wanting to move into teacher, mm-hmm. like more teacher all of the time. But with that, it's not 100% tied to this thing of money, but that does change the structure of the business, you know, of mm-hmm. letting go of no longer taking, um, 
you know, health insurance, which means that some of the people will not be able to come with me for their own financial abundance. And that I've been struggling with that for two years because I love these people and we've worked, we've, we've worked together, but they're also, I had to come to that place that you talked about of that caretaker in me that says, I have done a very good job of helping these people. They are going to be okay. And sometimes, you know, those relationships are here for a certain period of time and then it's time to move on and enter into that new phase. And like you said, some people will follow and new people will emerge. So true. You know? um, so yeah, so I have a couple of transitions that are going on right now that speak uh, very clearly to that. And you are right in this, in the work that we do is, you know, that responsibility in allowing those relationships to change and to be okay with feeling responsible for myself and taking care of myself and, you know, people taking care of themselves. So yes, that hit home, uh, like a big nail. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> sure did. Thank you. Um, and you know, I have to speak to something else that it was right at the end of the book, towards the end of the book. And I didn't even know that this was happening until I got to the end of the book. And you said, you know, a shift is probably already taking place. So um, one of the reasons why I think I'm so excited about coming into this this text and speaking to you and being connected, you know, to the Z's is I found when I was reading it, something really was shifting. I felt lighter. Um, I had like a bit of excitement and very emotional, uh, like a lot of gratitude and wanting to cry. And even a couple of times here, just in speaking with you and some of the words that you've spoken to me have just brought up these overwhelming, you know, emotions of, of like tears, but not sad tears, just like really boom to the heart. And, um, and another feeling that I had, like, even though I'm podcasting today, I have somebody else that I'm speaking to. I like, can't wait to get outside today and just interact with people. Um, <laughs> I don't, you know, and I'm like, Oh, I'm in such a great mood. And I wasn't even attributing it to the book. Sorry. I was just like, oh, I just might be in a really good mood today. You know, it's getting warmer in New York and it's sunny. Um, but then I get to the part where you were talking about even reading through this, you were going to notice that something is shifting, has already shifted or will continue. Mm continue to shift. And that is why I feel this is one of these books that provides that, that beauty of like magic and miracles. Something really has happened to me in reading this book this week. Um, I hope that that is the experience for everyone. Uh, maybe not to have the expectation. I hope I'm not putting too high of an expectation out there. Some people will have expectations and blah, but for me, I can only speak for me, uh, absolutely correct. When I got to that part of the book where it said, there is something that will be transforming in you through this text. So, whoa, holy cow. That's all I could say. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, thank you. And I, I, I know those words very well. Cause I just, um, I literally two days ago finished recording the audiobook version, which I think will come out end of June or July. And, um, yeah, as I, as I, as I got to the end of the text, we did it over five afternoon sessions. Um, I, I, it was interesting to, I hadn't seen the book for a year because the way publishing works, you know, you, you submit the manuscript about a year before a publisher releases releases it. And it was interesting going through all of the chapters. I think whenever we connect with anything like that, whenever, you know, you've just had an experience with a book or, you know, me going through the book again with the audiobook, it just realigns us, you know, whatever the vessel is, whether it's a person, whether it's a book, whether it's a workshop, whether it's a song. And I think if we keep repeatedly exposing ourselves to the kinds of energies we need to realign ourselves, we do start to generate that energy more and more, which which to me is just a reminder. It, it's in the same way we have to eat, drink, exercise every day. Mm -hmm. We do have to connect to spirit. And whether you do it through someone else or some other creation of someone else or yourself and channeling for yourself, which I'm a big advocate of. I, I say everyone should write themselves a few guided sentences every day if, if, if they feel to, because it, it is in all of us to connect with spirit source, our higher self. It may not be guides. It may not be energies. Um, so no, I'm really glad the book did that for you. And I, the, the older I've got, I'm 42 now, I've realized that the more we do that, the lighter and brighter and more sustained 
everything in us becomes so that when those challenging or those growth or those stress times come along, whether it's because of something you're going through or because a lot of people in your immediate circle are going through a lot of stress, you have more of a capacity to handle it and more tools and more of a, um, I have a very quick alarm system now. I mean, way back in the day, I would probably have let stress and overwhelm um, make me do <laughs> really stupid things for about a week. Um, <laughs> but now, you know, it, it, if I if I hit stress or overwhelm in my body, I catch it really quickly and I adjust my circumstances. Um, and I think that to me is one of the gifts of spiritual connection for us. It it helps us sense ourselves at a higher level than we were ever taught to at school or, you know, in, in our society, unless you come from a particularly wise or tribal culture where the sensory is not edited out of your education. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, and I have a couple of other just quick questions. I know we're slowly running out of time. I don't want to run out of time. I'm having so much fun. <laughs> Same. Um, but um, so where are, do you, you said that there were the original recordings of the channeling back from 2012, 2014. Mm -hmm. Do you guys actually have um, archives of that somewhere? We do. So some of the recordings um, are available. Some of them are no longer in my MP3 store. It depended on the quality of the recording itself and how relevant we felt it was. I think there's about, God, I want to say there might be 90 or 100 MP3s in my MP3 store. So they got, they, there came a point where we were like, okay, we need to curate some of this out because it's too much. Right. Um, so I, I know that things like sex and sexual energy. Um, I believe the art of receiving, there are probably several titles and you, you would find that at my website, leeharrisenergy.com. Um, and then if you wanted the audio, the new audio version of the whole thing, um, which is the book itself and the way that the book was edited, um, I actually narrate that myself and, and that will be available on Amazon and Audible um, around the end of June and into July. Oh, great. Okay. Very cool. Um, yes. And that kind of, I, then I was going to ask you to talk about your website, which you did because then I was like, <laughs> Oh, where are these? I just clicked on your store. I'm like, perfect. Um, but yeah, you have videos here, you have courses, uh, you have a portal, which is a membership, yes. um, which is great. Um, and then there's also the Steve Washington person on here. Yes. Um, and maybe we'll have to grab him too and talk with him. I was reading a little bit about his bio. It looks like he does, uh, Qigong, Qigong. He he, yes. So Stephen is my husband. And um, yeah, he teaches Qigong mindfulness. Um, and, and he actually has a few other specialist areas, like he's really passionate about teaching recovery, um, because that's been his personal journey. And so um, he teaches recovery and addiction as well. He has a course going at the moment. So I'm sure he would love to come on. Um, the one thing I will just add as well to any of your listeners is one of the things that I do every month that's free free and it's it's really the most popular thing I do um, at the moment. It's called an energy update video. And so um, around the first of the month, a new one comes out and they're normally about 12 to 15 minutes long. And in it, I talk really about what's going on energetically on the planet and what are the themes that might be coming up and showing up for you in this month and how to deal with it. Um, and that's the most widely received thing of anything that I do. And um, that's a video, but we also do a transcription. Um, so yeah, if you sign up for the newsletter on my website, um, you will receive that. Or if you're a YouTuber and you like YouTube, I have a YouTube channel called Lee Harris Energy. Beautiful. Well, my email is going to pop up in probably about 10 minutes. So just let me know. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, yeah. And uh, Lee, this is wonderful. One of the ways that what I was called to, because um, I do feel like there's quite a bit of channeling that happens for me through the podcast with the questions that I get, the things that come to mind. I mean, I, I, it's really hard for me to take any credit for any of these conversations that I have. But when I was reading the book, I was told um, a way to end it. And the way that I'd like to end the podcast for our listeners is I would like to give them the gift. If for any reason they're not going to go out and buy the book, which I definitely think that they need to and should, I wanted to end our conversation 
um, with the promise to love myself. And I, it looked to me, it looks like a poem, but it's something that is in your book as one of the exercises of something that people can say to themselves. Um, I am probably going to type this up and, um, credit you and the Z's and give it to so many people that come through my door, but I thought it would be a beautiful way to end our conversation. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to take a little bit just to read that. Okay. All right. So listeners, it's time to listen up. Here's one of the best messages that I received from this book. And it says, I promise to love myself. I promise to continue to learn more about loving myself. And when I am not being self-loving, I invite my soul to show me this. I promise to give myself the freedom to explore this world, to do everything I want to do. I choose to experience myself at higher levels I choose to turn my focus away from pain and struggle. I choose effortless living, turning my focus toward joy and peace. I will give myself space to discover who I am. I love myself so much that I allow myself to make huge mistakes. I love myself so much that I will always forgive myself. I trust in my love for myself so much that I know that whatever situations I end up in, when I remember to feel my way through them rather than think my way through them, I will always come back to the place I need and want to be in. I vow to honor, love, and cherish my body and my soul always. And so it is. So thank you, Lee. Thank you, Zs. <laughs> thank you. Um, it was, yeah. And, you know, I was just at a, a retreat and a woman had said, how do I love people that I don't even know or that I just met? And I feel that way about you. I love you and I don't even know you, but I love you. <laughs> I was, so. you know, I could talk to you for hours. So thank you, you know, which isn't always the case. So thank yeah. you. Thank you so thank much. Um, a real pleasure to um, to be here. And thank you to you and Mike. Um, I said to you guys before we got on the recording, I, I, I hadn't heard of you guys or the podcast before the publisher set this up. But in looking at what, what you guys are doing, it's fantastic. And I'm, I'm always cheering on any other creatives who, who are doing what they're doing in the world um, because I think it's it's a bit like the wild, wild west since the internet. You know, you can create anything, but I also know how much energy and passion and time has to go into that kind of stuff. So kudos to both of you. Thank you for having me on. Yes, thank you so much. This was a blessing and I'm glad our paths crossed. <laughs> me too. Thanks for listening to the Path 11 podcast today. I hope you all enjoyed this show. And if you haven't checked out our Patreon page, I'd like you to do so because we are going to start putting some content over there that is only for our Patreon subscribers. You can get content for as little as donating a dollar a month, and it could just be a one-time donation. We have other freebies over there that you can get depending upon how much you would like to donate. And again, it could be a one-time donation, or you can continue to keep your subscription on a monthly basis at that donation level, but I just put my MBT immersive experience, which was a four day, four day intensive meditation training in Tennessee with physicist Tom Campbell. I was listening to binaural beats, going to altered states of consciousness, having out of body experiences and life changing experiences that I was able to bring back uh, for myself, for my clients, for my friends that was just out of this world. So if you would like to listen to that, I'd like you to head on over to path11podcast.com. You're going to see an orange button that says Patreon. Become a Patreon today and you can have access to that podcast. And I would like to remind you to head on over to path11productions.com and check out the membership that we have for the Afterlife Awareness Conference. We have over 25 hours of footage with amazing speakers like William Buhlman, Thomas John, Terry Daniel, Suzanne Geisman, Suzanne Northrup, Linda Fitch, uh, Austin Wells, just a few people uh, to name off that were amazing. These workshops are just so valuable. So I think that you would really enjoy it. It's also a great thing to think about to maybe give the gift to somebody who is struggling with grief. If you are looking for resources, this is a great conference to send people to to check out. And thanks again for listening today. Mm-hmm.